Hello, I'm Andrea Goodman, conductor of the Cantalina Chamber Choir here in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts. On Talking Choral Music, I introduce you to people from the world of choral music, some well-known and others you should know about who are doing amazing things. In this episode, find out what it's like to sing in the Metropolitan Opera Chorus, considered by most choral singers to be the greatest job on earth. Today's guests are Kurt Finney, who is a tenor and the chorus's manager, and Sven Leaf, who retired after a 30-year career as a baritone in the chorus. They have a few amazing stories to share with you today. Thanks for watching, and please click on the subscribe button so you won't miss each new episode. <laughs> It's great when they have someone they know, because as I said, that's really huge and that remains huge with us. My, uh, my first callback, because I didn't get hired the first callback I had, uh, I, I was t called in and said they, they had uh, an opening in, in the tenor section. So I was like, great. Uh, they, they wanted me to come and sing for it. So I did. And I sang an aria with like, you know, 10 high C's. It was from Cenerentola. And it's like, you know, <laughs> high C, high C, high C, high C. I'm going to like show them every high note I've got. Mm -hmm. And then when I finished, you know, they said, well, that's great, but this is a second tenor position. Oh, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh, great. You know, I said, you know, because, you know, you, you know how your voice works. It's, I think Tatiana Troyana said, uh, she said, the voice is like a bed sheet. You pull it up too high and your feet stick out. You know, once I had all those high C's, I had no bottom. So I was like, you know, let me go. I'll have a cigar and a scotch. I'll be back in an hour and then I'll sing something for second tenor. <laughs> but they, said, they said, no, you're a first tenor and we don't have an opening for that right now. They did the following year, but uh, it was just kind of funny because I just didn't know and I, uh, I just heard it was a tenor position. So that, well, I guess that means you should, you should do your research. <laughs> so Sven, um, I, I have a question. Um, what did you have to do to stay in the chorus year after year? Do you have to re-audition every year? Do you have to pass some no. sort of a test? Well, what, what it was interesting though, because when I was in the extra chorus, you didn't have to re-audition, but I did just, and that I got hired each year, I got hired for more operas. Like I had two operas the first season, four the next, and then six the third season, you know? So, you know, other people next year go, why are you re-auditioning? I said, well, I don't want them to forget who I am, you know? and. Uh, so it, but once it, you were in the regular the chorus, did you have to do something every year to um, maintain your position? Well, you have to perform well, basically. And if you get called in, if there's something that's lacking, I mean, uh, Maisha Steinbender one time said, you're sticking out in, in Bohem. You know, I was up on the top deck and walking with straight out, you know. Well, that, you know, maybe I was sticking out, but he would always listen from like, the back of the dress circle. So I was probably singing right out there. And a lot of the basses were, baritones were down on the front kind of circling in a, in a thing. But, uh, you know, so I tried to tone it down a little bit, but, but once that poem opens with that thing, you know, you want a, a real rush of sound going out from the chorus. And, uh, and somehow being in the back like that, I felt like I was kind of off in the, uh, what, the, uh, the, but, the start of it, you know, the, the start of it, the, 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 you know, something that kind of the peop, other people who were up there, uh, Maestro Palumbo always said he wants the, the first note in from the chorus to be from the basses, never from a, a high voice. <laughs> just because, but, uh, go ahead. You know, just to just to tune to it, I guess, you know. Right. right. Yeah. But we do, uh, we, we, we don't have to re-audition as a member of the regular chorus. The extra chorus does now, and for decades has been obliged to re-audition to be a candidate for rehire. But the uh, the regular chorus, once you're in, uh, it's your job to keep your voice together. But of course, they have mechanics if you don't. You know, there's, there's things that they'll, the, the chorus master can to seek you out and say, this is a problem or that's a problem. Uh, you know, so there's, there are mechanisms for them to address if you're, if you're, if the voice is not holding together well. Uh, but you know, these are most of the people we're, we're hiring such a small fraction of the people that audition that usually the technique level is so high that you know people know how to navigate their voice. You know, the hardest thing is 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 not finding people with uh, appropriate technique. But the one thing that maybe someone even with great technique is not accustomed to is how to deal with the unique. Uh, uniquely relentless rehearsal performance schedule. And that gets you back to the marking and everyone has to figure out how they're going to mark. 
the thing you can't be doing is marking down the octave because it really sonically just screws oh, up. So, so usually it's like, you know, you figure out how to get off the voice or to do, a, you know, a, a falsetto or whatever you need if in a, in a non-orchestra rehearsal situation. Obviously, when the orchestra is there, we need to, they need to balance the sound. So you got to sing it properly. But uh, in, in staging rehearsals and in List Hall, you duck out of the high notes that you don't need to squander in those environments. Um, and, uh, but you don't, as I said, don't sing down the octave because it just screws up the fabric that the chorus master is listening to and trying to assess. But there must be a few singers who don't want to admit that they're uh, beginning to age out or the vibrato is starting to slow down or stick out or, you know, are there are rules and regulations around that sort of right. thing? No, there's a, there's a clause in the CBA for vocal deterioration. And there's a whole, it's a two year process uh, that basically says if things aren't good, then you get a notice of warning and then you have six months or something to address it that at the end of that period, uh, the, then the, the chorus master has to then say, it's okay, or they issue you a, a letter of vocal deterioration saying that it's not okay. And then you're, you can then contest it. And there is a panel review where you do, an, if you want, you do an audition in front of a panel of three people, one from the Met, one from uh, outside the Met, it's, it's, uh, and then one, uh, one from labor, one from management and one third party. And, and then if you pass that, then you remain in the course and it's over, you're still in the course. And if you don't, then you would be done at the end of that year. So it's a two year process of evaluating. It's rarely invoked. It's, you know, and as I said, for the most part, we're, you know, we have such strong singers that there isn't any need to, you know, so. 36 years in between extra course and, and regular course, I think it was invoked maybe three or four times, you know, and sometimes it might be done when you don't even hear about it. If, if the, the person who's doing it, it keeps it to himself, you know, you, yes. you might not even know about it. But it, and I think it's, it's type of a thing. I mean, if, if the chorus master really wants to get, you know, get rid of you, he can arrange an audition <laughs> for you that you, he knows you can't, you know, you won't make it through, you know, because you, you select, I think, an aria and then they select an aria or whatever, you know, but it's, it's kind of to show the full range of, of the vocal part you're singing. And uh, yeah. I've never presided over or been privy to the process. Yeah, uh, nobody wants to do it because like, you know, the, the Met will uh, get somebody, you know, or somebody from staff that that's okay. But then the person who comes in from outside, you know, the, the unbiased person, he doesn't want to go in and, and, you know, maybe he's a coach, you know, and, and go against what the Met wants to, him to do, you know, it's, it's different difficult position for that person. Of course, the the um, AGMA or, or the other representative is going to try to make the best, uh, you know, case for the person singing that they can, you know, it may, may not be good. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to be like, just say something totally wrong when or inaccurate, you know, but so. It, it's, but it's, you know, it's, it's not a common event. Uh, as I said, I don't, I've never really observed it uh, because I'm a, both a member of management and also a still a full-time singer in the Met Chorus. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so because these are my colleagues, I don't, <laughs> I don't want any part of it. It's, I'm not going to pass judgment on them. I'm a business manager. So I just deal with, with my colleagues. I'm just dealing with the payroll and the rehearsal schedule and the budgets and things like that. But everything that's artistic, that's a, that's an ultimate artistic decision is going to fall with Palumbo, who is the current chorus master. So how many singers would you say get accepted in the regular chorus and how many get into the extra chorus or, um, you know, well, there's got to be very few because that's... And right. For, for the regulars, for the regulars, I, if I had to average it out, I'd say no more than two a year for the regulars. And it might be, you know, 1.5 a year or something like that, you know, that in terms of turnover. Um, <clears throat> for the extra chorus, it depends. The extra chorus has, uh, has a clause in the contract that says if they were in the previous iteration of a returning production, let's say we did Aida two years ago and you were in it as an extra chorister and then it comes back, you get first consideration, which really means as long as you're in reasonable vocal shape, you're gonna be put back in it. And so how many spaces open up depends on how many people don't come back, uh, don't re-audition for the, for the spot that they formally held. Uh, or you're doing an opera that you haven't done before that involves extra chorus 
For example, uh, last year we did, uh, two years ago, I guess we did Porgy. Well, the Met hasn't done Porgy in quite some time. So, uh, so we had suddenly 60 openings, you know, because it was 30 men and 30 women. So it really, it, you know, it depends on what the repertoire is for that season. This coming season, we're going to be doing Meistersinger, uh, Boris Gudinoff, uh, Turandot, uh, Don Carlo, Eugene Onegin. Um, all of these involve extra chorus. So uh, there's some, there's a, a number of opportunities. Several of those are big operas, uh, Meistersinger and, 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 um, and Boris Gudinoff, you know have a fairly hefty uh, extra chorus. So, so there should be a number of opportunities there and hopefully we'll, we'll get not only the excellent people we've had in it before, but we'll also end up with some new people as well. It's just, it's, you know, it's like a, the uh, farm league for a, for a baseball team. It's a great way to be introduced to some great singers. So they have to send in a tape and... Um, it's usually, tape. yeah, usually they send in a resume, references and an audio clip. Um, and then based upon the quality of that, Maestro Palomo goes through and, and, and decides who he wants to give a live audition to uh, based on their experience and the audio clip or whatever. And, uh, and then we have the actual auditions where we'll hear maybe uh, 300 people, three to 400 people over the, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, you'll get about 600 applicants, you might hear three or 400 and you'll hire you know, 1.5 regulars and maybe uh, 15 to 30, uh, 15 or 20 extra new extras as opposed to the returning extras, you know? So you know, there's usually opportunity every year. Wow, Sven, I wonder if it was as rigorous when you started to have to pass an audition like that. Um, you mean, when going you back, well, I didn't have, you didn't have to send in, in a tape or, you know, you. The thing was that when I first went to the audition, they gave you a three by five card. You put your name, your vocal part, uh, any opera choral experience you might have had, and then you went and maybe you might have written what aria you were doing, and you want to know. You didn't even write that. You went down and you uh, you announced it. But it was a, a real zoo. I mean, there may be two hundred people. You know, so you had people uh, vocalizing in the bathroom because they just let them in, uh, and uh, you know you you'd be standing around. Uh, Agma people got first chance at it, and then uh, uh, you know you, you just everybody's nervous, or you know, so you just try to relax as much as possible, and you go in and sing your best. And uh, you know, it was I don't I don't know that the results were any difference, but the year I was hired, it was an unusual uh, year in that there were five new choristers that were hired that year, and uh, I was the only um, only man, but there were like two sopranos and two uh, mezzi in it, and. Uh, <laughs> Well, my second year, there was, uh, um, well, that was when my second year in the extra course, they did um, Boris Kudinov, and I got into that, you know, well, there were about 12 of us who'd never done it, so then they would have uh, a rehearsal for all those who had never done it. Now, I was the only bass that time, there were a couple of people who had come into that rehearsal knowing it cold, you know. Well, I, I didn't go that far with it, but uh, there was one section where it's a very fast chorus. It starts at Raska di Lusraskulia, Sudamala Djetskaya. Well, it's basis for about uh, three pages of kind of high tessitura and a, and a bundle of words to do. And so he had me going over and over and over that. And then finally, one of the tenors, a good friend and colleague, John Bills, who was, who was also, he was a steady extra at that time, which they had, he said, Give him a break, <laughs> you know, after a while. because it was something that was not healthy to sing right in a row like that, you know, and particularly by yourself. It was, it was, you couldn't turn the pages fast enough, type of thing, and the tempo taken. And when you're, when you're more or less sight reading it, it was. Uh, and, uh, I'd been through it a little bit, but it was something that you, you know, that's not how you I learned it. <laughs> right. So, um, inquiring minds want to know. I'm sure everybody is very curious. Can you make a living? Can you have a family? Can you buy a house? Um, you know, how good is the, the the salary for chorus members at the Met? Well, you know, it's it's Sven and I both have three kids, so uh, we both raised uh, families and uh, we both lived in houses. So uh, you know, uh, outside of the city, uh, I I guess the way I would describe it is that uh, that the quality of existence for for a chorister was something akin to maybe upper middle class is what I would say. And would you say, Sven? I mean, like the houses were, 
pretty normal looking. No yeah. one's living in a McMansion. Yeah. You know, you're living in a ranch or a split or a small colonial or whatever. I bought a two bedroom colonial and did an addition on it, you know, but, you know, so, so no one is buying a, a full out McMansion, uh, even working at the Met. Uh, but, you know, for a musician, it's a, it's a much better living than, than anywhere else. I mean, I left academia. I'm not the only person I know that and went into opera for the money, but it paid better than my academic salary. <laughs> so at the Met, you know, so. It's, it's a good salary for a singer. You know, you, you can't do a better, I guess maybe Vienna opera pays more or something, because, but that's a state run thing, you know, and uh, state money behind it. But, uh, like I said, they used to have in the times that one, you know, once a year they'd have this, what the medium level of income was. Well, I, you know, what they call for a family of four in Manhattan, which was the neighborhood that you're singing, you know, it was like sending your kids to the most expensive uh, private schools. But it, my my income as a Met was always just about half of that, you know. But but for living out in Harrington Park, New Jersey, it was it was fine. I mean, we weren't on the top of the income levels there, but we, you know. We didn't feel uh, like you know, it was. It was a very kind of nice, uh, right? To someone thing. in Kansas, the Met salary may seem exorbitantly high, but the quality of life that you it actually produces for the area in which you're obliged to live is, you know, upper middle class is what I would say, you know. And so, which is to say, quite comfortable. Uh, it's a great job, um, and you, no one leaves. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> You know, it's not it's not like people get the Met job and say, nah, I'm done with it. You know, no, it is too good a job. And and people may complain about it at times, you know, because it's grueling and it's, you know, high pressure. Uh, and they ask a lot of us, and well, they should. I mean, it's like playing on the Yankees. They're supposed to ask a lot of you. You're you're in the, the biggest, most famous, you know, classical venue in the country and arguably in the world. So uh, yeah, they're gonna ask a lot of you and you have to produce, you can't be dropping balls. So they're gonna be on you to make sure that you're, you know, that you are living up to the extraordinary standard that you have to. And as a consequence, you make a much better living than anywhere else you're going to make in the arts, in the classical arts, you know, as a, you know, as a non soloist. And frankly, we get a lot of people who are former soloists that want to join the chorus because, you know, that's not the greatest life either. It's if freelancing is, is difficult. So, so the fact that you have benefits and you have a pension and you have uh, you know, uh, uh, 52 weeks of work and, uh, you know, an upper middle class income and you can have stability and you don't need a manager um, are all reasons why it is the excellent job that it is. And Not putting it's, up it's, a suitcase all the time, you know. And, uh, right, right. You don't need to travel other than the, you know, the occasional tour, which that hasn't happened in years. It's too expensive now to move the Met around anywhere. So we're really just right here. So it's, it's an ideal job. It's in a very well paying job. And, uh, and, and for it, they, you know, you have to, you have to deliver. Right. Well, I guess the only other chorus like that, that I know of is that the singing sergeants, right? But then you have to go through basic training for. <laughs> right. But we've, we've hired a number of singing yeah. sergeants. So they, they were willing to, 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 uh, to, to pass on that career. And the Met is, is probably going to compensate you. I mean, that's a great job and I have nothing but respect for it. And the people we've gotten who are a part of it, we're all great choristers, great singers, but more likely you go from singing sergeant to the Met than the other way. Right, uh, I would think. <laughs> Dustin, you know, that, um, that came from the singing sergeants or, or some- Dustin, you know, yeah, he was in, the, was in the Navy, the Navy yeah. uh, iteration of that, uh, yeah. yeah. So yep. Sven, um, I'd just like to ask you in the last few minutes, if you had to pick one story from your career, falling scenery, the show almost didn't go on, last minute unexpected changes. What would that be? Can you give us one memory that sticks the, out? The one that, that was is an embarrassing one was it was uh, the first night in Japan, I, I forget which city it was in, but we were doing Rigoletto. And there was, you know, it was a, the open scene is a party and I had this heavy cape on and uh, my staging was to go down and, and pick up a ballet girl who was in a long big gown, you know, well, she has to, to gather her get, dress up, you know, to keep it off the floor. So I pick her up and she hadn't done it. And I didn't know until I had to carry her upstage about 20 feet. Well, I was walking on her dress and we both fell down right, right by the prompter's box. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard, you know, it was hard to kind of, uh, you know, 
make something good out of that. But, uh, you know, we hammed it up a little bit and managed to uh, go on because because I had to go to another partner right after I'd carried dropped her off somewhere. You know, it was. Uh... <laughs> I see. And, and, and Kurt, I'm sure you have a million things. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, my most memorable uh, night was actually just my opening night. And it was memorable, not because anything particularly funny, but actually just because of something spectacular, which is to say that my opening night, they did uh, Pagliacci and Tabaro. It was a double bill, Il Tabaro and, and Pagliacci. And uh, the singers were uh, Teresa Stratus, uh, uh, who was spectacular and a legend, and uh, Placido Domingo in Il Tabaro and Juan Pons as the baritone in both Tabaro and in Pagliacci and Pavarotti in Pagliacci. So you had just <laughs> these luminaries. And uh, so that to me was perhaps the most exciting thing was to start my career with those kind of luminaries, you know, on the stage. And uh, especially Pavarotti who, had, uh, who I, you know, my, my first rehearsal on stage with him. Uh, he was doing Canio and Pagliacci and uh, he has a big opening aria. He rolls in on a wagon and, the, and the, 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 the awning on the wagon goes up and he starts with his big opening aria. And I was standing just a few feet from him on the first main stage rehearsal. And I was just floored by how loud it was. And this was the thing that surprised me because Pavarotti, you know, you think of, you know, he's in the Marino and it's, it's, there's a lyricism to his voice, but my God, it was huge. And, and, and I think that's what made him the vocal freak of nature that he was, was that it was so big and yet still beautiful. Uh, you know, he was bigger than I thought. You know, I thought I'd see a short tenor and he was like six feet, you know, and had a oh. head and a barrel chest. And uh, so that all of the dimensions of him, you know, and that's the other thing you'll notice in Met Soloists that they're all giants, you know, typically. I mean, you have the exceptions like, you know, uh, uh, von Stata or something like that. But for the most part, you know, the Met soloists, you know, they, when they, when they walk in, you're always looking up. <laughs> yeah. they, you know, and then talking about Teresa Stratus, you know, I always preferred being with a singer like that, who was also an excellent actor, you know, oh, there, so, you know, that, that made the show as far as I was concerned. Yeah. And then uh, like another soprano was Hildegard Behrens, who her voice was not the prettiest, but, but, you know, when she did Maria in, in uh, Otsek, you know, and, or did, did, uh, even the Wagner, it was it was uh, special because it, she she really had her heart and soul in it, and uh, th that was another thing that uh, was was good. Like uh, we did a lot of Otto Schenk operas, or for he was the stage man Produ producer yeah. production, you know, and they were always beautiful, realistic sets. But he always gave the chorus kind of uh, he he wanted you to not be talking at all, but he gave you flexibility. Like we did Parsifal, and he was the only he was came from a comedic background in theater. And he always wanted to find a spot for humor. So, you know, we would be <laughs> doing Parsifal and act like we're la laughing our, uh, you know, our asses off. You know, when when uh, somebody came in, I forget who it was, one of the very serious characters, you know, and, and the, they take up the, the uh, shroud over uh, whoever, who is that baritone that we're following around? Um, Fortis um, and his Fortis, father. Yeah, yeah. Peterell was the father that's yeah, dead. Peterell. Yeah, Well, they take that off, and he wanted us to just groan like, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, where the where the Holy Grail or Knights of the Holy Grail walking around and chasing this, and uh, once it gets there, it's it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Schenk was a great director, did fabulous productions, and he was very funny. Great, and he would act out things for us as uh, demonstrating how he wanted things to be handled. So, an excellent, excellent director. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine the uh, the amount of repertoire trivia uh, and <laughs> opera you you must have in your brains. You know, to you can do that little quiz they do at intermission and right. never fail because oh yeah, you have we could so bore people everything. <laughs> What's that? I said we could bore people for hours with our story. <laughs> there are some people in the chorus who have these phenomenal memories, you know, cursed by one, but, but you know, once it's there, like Maria Didaldi was one, you know, she could, you know, anything that had happened in her brain, she could bring it right back, you know, and, um, it, you know, it's a wonderful gift, but <laughs> might not be so good to live with, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on if she remembers what she had for breakfast, you know, she could yeah, probably yeah. tell you, uh, you know, and then in 1967, what she said, right. uh, yeah. Yeah. what happened in particular in some opera then. 
So uh, this you you have the greatest job in the world. It seems like both of you, um, everybody. Most would, definitely. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Well, that's great, and I see upcoming that the Met has a lot of things planned. Yes, we have I mean, a lot of things coming up. I think it's going to be an exciting season. Uh, you know, uh, I think Meister Singer is always uh, an exciting event when we do that at the Met. Of course, uh, Porgy is coming back, which was a huge hit. Uh, and uh, there's another new opera being done called Fire Shut Up in My Bones by another contemporary composer. So, so it, it's, it's going to be uh, an exciting year. And I think everyone, God willing, we're going to have a vaccine that's out and that is going to make people safe and comfortable to go back to the theater because I think everyone is desperate to be reunited yes. with the arts in person. Oh, yeah. So I want to thank you very much for participating today. And um, this will go down in the annals of history as a <laughs> more interesting chorus uh, conversations that <laughs> that we can have because uh, most people don't get to see the, the inside view of of what goes on. It's just uh, it's it's incredible what what's required. And um, and now, of course, all of us watching, listening, have a not that we didn't appreciate this before, but now especially a newfound appreciation. So it's thank a, you. it's a thank you for having us and giving us the opportunity to describe what it's like at the Met. It is the greatest job in the world, and I count myself uh, blessed every day for having landed this fabulous job. If you like this video, just click the button below to subscribe. And thanks for watching.